want to thank everyone who came out this evening. I hope that this study is beneficial to you. And I want to make a request before we even dive into this topic that you kind of answer in your mind, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? I'll give you a second. Formulate it. Take it. Throw it away. No, I'm just kidding. Don't throw it away. Put it in your back pocket and then approach this study with a clear mind and then compare it just as the Bereans would uh, to see if it is in fact true. Because we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture and whenever I approach the study of this topic I kind of had some preconceived thoughts of what it was and I wouldn't say my thoughts changed greatly but there were some nuances in my understanding that changed. So I hope that these nuances are scriptural, <laughs> and I, I hope you see that as well. So we're going to be looking at a lot of verses today. And this verse in particular has caused a lot of controversy. Um, it's caused a lot of changes in theology over the years where, you know, uh, things have been incorporated based on an understanding of this verse. Uh, many times I think they're incorrect. But it's important for us to understand this. Peter and Paul both quoted Joel 32, 2.32 in Acts 2.21 and Romans 10.13. And they said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Since many people seem confident that calling on the name of the Lord carries the idea of saying, like this young man is saying, Lord, save me or something to that effect, or maybe saying a sinner's prayer, I thought it would be good to study that out. This is a very common teaching. Uh, we find it in a variety of congregations, denominational and non-denominational. Even in Houston, Texas, there's a, a large church that many of us have probably heard of called Lakewood. And there's a teacher there named Joel Osteen. Osteen is a pretty popular guy. He writes many books, and he's well known for his teachings. And he seems to believe that calling on the name of the Lord is simply saying a prayer to God. This is what he says. I'm not here to condemn anyone. This is taken off one of his sermons. I'm not here to condemn anyone, but rather to help you find a new beginning. I know that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Why don't we, uh, why don't we pray, uh, pray with me? Well, that's not, why, why don't we pray with me today? Just say, this is the part that many people would call like the sinner's prayer, and there's a you know, large variety, and many will say that it's personal, however you want to say it. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. Wash me clean. I make you my Lord and Savior. He said, friend, if you prayed this simple prayer, we believe you got born again. The scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's just what you did. So, I don't, I'm not here to pick on Joel. This is not the idea. I'm not trying to slander Joel in any way. Uh, that's not my intention. But Joel is not exclusive in this kind of teaching. Many of the churches that, you, that we go and visit, or maybe there's some here who go to a congregation who preaches this, will say a similar thing. That if you just say a prayer similar to this, you will be saved. So I think it's important to study it together. Before we say whether Joel was right or wrong, let's study from the Word of God. So how does one call on the name of the Lord? That is the big question. How is that done? Uh, does it look like this or does it look like something else? What does it look like? And the reason that this is important is because it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That makes it very important because I assume this is an assumption. Sometimes my assumptions are wrong. But I assume that everyone in this room wants to be saved. Otherwise, you picked a weird place to be on a Saturday night. There's great ramifications in understanding what this means. Romans 10.13, 
says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2.21 says, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here, in both of these verses, uh, both Peter and, I'm sorry, both Paul in Romans 10.13 and Peter in Acts 2.21 are quoting from the same prophecy in Acts 2.32. So, both of these verses state that our salvation is dependent on us calling on the name of the Lord. And so, it's important for us to interpret this correctly. Because if you don't interpret this statement correctly, then I would say your salvation is at risk. We have to accomplish what the criteria is putting forth. So, if you were to tell someone, this is Houston, we have palm trees in our parks. Uh, if you were to tell someone, meet me at the park and I will give you $100. Okay? Pretty straightforward. If that person didn't come to the park, they're not going to get the $100. We all understand that. They didn't meet the criteria that was set forth. If a person responds to that same criteria. The criteria is put forth, come to the park and I'll give you $100. But instead, you go to the grocery store. Are you going to get that $100? No, you're not going to get the $100 because you didn't meet the criteria set forth. And so, not calling on the name of the Lord disqualifies you for salvation just as much as calling on the name of the Lord incorrectly does. Hopefully you're following my logic here. I use these two analogies to say this. We need to understand what these verses are telling us to do. Is it telling us to go to the park? Is it telling us to go to the grocery store? Is it telling me to do nothing? What is it telling me to do? We have to make sure that we are in fact meeting the criteria set forth by Paul and set forth by Peter, and by extension, God. And to make sure we aren't showing up to the grocery store instead of the park, we're going to study it out. When the doctor goes to the hospital to call on a patient, some patients, he does this, uh, he wouldn't do this with a patient, he wouldn't walk into the room and say, hello, I'm your doctor, I wish you the best, and then walk out. That's probably not what is intended by the doctor, and that's probably not what calling on the patient means. On the contrary, it involves him involving himself in a service. He might examine a patient. He might listen to the patient's concerns. He might give further instructions regarding the patient's hopeful recovery, and do other things that doctors do that I don't know because I didn't go to medical school. But there's a certain things that he would do and certain things that would be involved in calling on a patient. And in the mid-20th century, it was common for a young man to call on a young lady. He would say, I'm going to call on this young lady. And the meaning can be different depending on context. Because calling on a girl would be different than a doctor calling on a patient. Otherwise, that might be a pretty strange first date. So, context is also important. And I think we're going to see that as we move forward. That sometimes we can use the same words, but in the context it can mean two different things. So, when an individual, individual takes the time to study the expression calling on God or calling on the name of the Lord throughout Scripture, the only reasonable conclusion that we can draw is just as similar phrases sometimes have a deeper meaning in modern America. The expression calling on God or calling on the Lord often had a deeper meaning in biblical times. So let's look at the way these phrases are used. And I believe 
when we see the phrase used, we oftentimes see a contrast. Genesis 4 is the first time we see this expression, calling on the name of the Lord. A lot has been going on leading up to this point. And so we'll get to the context in a second, but first I want to read the verse. Genesis 4, 25 through 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So there's, there's our phrase for, for the first time in Scripture. So what is the context here? What is going on in these verses? We have to look at what was going on before this. So Adam and Eve have a son named Cain and Abel. They mo both make an offering to God. One does so in faith, according to Hebrews 11. The other does not. The one who does not, Cain, gets jealous of his brother Abel and kills him. Okay? Because of this sin, Cain gets banished from Eden. He, he's sent off to the land of Nod where he has a family and he has some descendants as well. So in Genesis chapter 4, we see a lineage of Cain listed and also descriptions of the type of people that these descendants were. And when you read through this list, these are people that you don't want to hang out with. Some of them, you know, it's the first time polygamy becomes uh, an issue in the Bible. We also have Lamech, who is bragging about killing someone. He's saying, if, if you thought Cain was bad, look how bad I am, and so on and so forth. These were not good people. There's a contrast. Here, Adam and Eve have another son named Seth. And Seth has a son named Enosh. And then men began to call on the name of the Lord. The contrast is, those who were descendants of Cain, who were living a life of sin and immorality, and the lineage of Seth, who called on the name of the Lord. So I want us to just take that contrast and just put it in the back po pocket with your understanding of uh, calling on the name of the Lord. Keep it there. We'll bring it out in a second. So, Genesis 12, 7 through 8, is another place we see this phrase, uh, calling on the name of the Lord, or called on the name of the Lord at the end here. And this is in the life of Abram, who would later become Abraham. And he, the land of Canaan has been promised to Abraham. This is the promised land. This is the land promise, as we often refer to it. The people that inhabit this land were idolatrous people, sinful people. God was displeased with them and ultimately would order that they be destroyed, utterly destroyed. And Abraham, at this time, is a sojourner in the land of Canaan, in this sinful land. He built an altar in Bethel. That brings us to Genesis 12. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to to your descendants I will give this land. And th there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. When we immediately take a look at this verse, we have something that's happening. He's building an altar and he's calling on the name of the Lord. So from this verse, remember context is important and it can mean different things in different contexts. In this context, we would say that calling on the name of the Lord may be worship because he's building an altar and that's him calling on the name of the Lord. And he stood in contrast to those around him, those who were steeped in idolatry and serving other gods. This altar stood as a sign as a commitment and a submission to God. That was the point. 
And he said, by calling on the name of the Lord, or by calling on the name of the Lord, he was submitting himself to the one and only true God instead of the other gods surrounding him in that land. In the face of rebellion, apostasy, general sin around you, calling on the name of the Lord is submitting yourself to the Lord and to the authority of the Lord. So, you stand for God. You listen to the Lord and you obey his commandments. And certainly, this is the best description of Abram or Abraham or whatever you want to call him in this place. Now, just after this, well, in between 12 and 13, there's a famine that comes on the land. And so, rather than trusting in God, Abram goes to Egypt. There he lies that, you know, his wife is a sister and so on and so forth. But then he comes back to the land and he, built, he goes to the altar again and recommits himself to God because he had lost faith and he had left and gone to Egypt. And it says at that time, again, he was calling on the name of the Lord. He was committing himself again to the one and only true God. So, let's fast forward to the New Testament. And in order to fast forward to the New Testament, we really have to continue in the Old Testament. Because the New Testament is quoting Joel 2, verse 32, which is a prophecy in the Old Testament. So we already said that Acts 21 and Romans 13 is quoting Joel 2. So what is going on in Joel chapter 2, specifically verse 32? In Joel 2, actually Joel 1, sorry, in Joel 1 he begins with a description of a locust invasion. And really, in the book of Joel, you have chapter 1 and you have chapter 2, and they kind of run parallel. In chapter 1, you have a locust invasion, and it's talking about the day of the Lord uh, that has happened in the past. You have a locust invasion that is uh, wreaking havoc on the land, and then you have a call for repentance. That's Joel chapter 1. It says, Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened, happened in your days, or even the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and let their children, another generation, what the chewing locust left. The swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust has left, the consuming locust has eaten. In other words, all these different types of locusts, they're consuming everything. This is a plague on the land. Now, fast forward to chapter 2. We have another day of the Lord, but this is looking to the future. This is looking to the kingdom of God. And it tells of, of a, instead of locusts, it talks about great armies and things of that nature. So, He's talking about this locust invasion, and, and really what this is symbolizing here is God's judgment against the sins of Israel. And he paints this desperate picture for the nation. And we don't really know what time frame Joel was written in. Um, he refers to many other uh, Old Testament books in his writings, and he has many prophecies. Most people think that it was written kind of during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but no one really knows for sure. But what we do know is that it seems that the pe people of Israel have fallen out of God's good graces, which could be a number of, <laughs> of times in the Old Testament because they did it over and over and over again. It was a repeating trend. He goes on to tell them, All the trees of the field have withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. This is Joel 2, 12 through 13. And so then he issues a call for repentance. What, what else do you do in a situation where you've fallen from the good graces of God other than to repent of your sins and turn towards him? 
He says, Rend your heart of your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness. And the picture changes a little bit more towards the end of Joel 2. God promises to restore what has been eaten by the locusts and come live with his people. It's a prophecy of the kingdom. Twice he tells them, my people shall never be put to shame. In other words, what he's saying in that phrase, my people shall ne never be put to shame, is I'm going to keep my promises. So they're never going to have to endure the shame of, you know, that promise never being kept. So spiritually waiting on God, his people shall not have the shame of disappointment in their expectation of God. So what is the promise? First, the first promise is a physical return to the land after exile. Okay? A physical return to the land. But there's more than a physical return. Joel 2, 28 through 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men's servants and on my maids' servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and, on the, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And here we go. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord has called. So this is what Acts 2.21 and also Romans 10.32 are quoting. God's Spirit will announce the coming of salvation, not just to Israel, but it's important to note that this is for somewhere in here. It talks about it. I know it's there. Hmm. Okay, right here. That I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Okay? Again, take all flesh, put it in your back pocket with the other two things that I told you to keep there. Okay? All flesh. This is a fulfillment of the promise of salvation in the kingdom of God that is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 where Peter quoted this verse. The Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2, just prior, or actually during, Peter's sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.21. And I think sometimes, in understanding what this means, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord, we can say that the Bible is sometimes the best interpreter. We can interpret things a, a whole myriad of ways. In fact, this verse has been interpreted a myriad of ways, but sometimes the Bible explains itself very simply. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter's giving this great sermon. He tells them, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He talks about all the transgressions of the Jewish people, how Jesus came and he preached the gospel to him and they put him to death and that he was the son of God. And so the people who are listening to that sermon are saying, what can we do? What have I done? How do I get back into God's good graces? That's the question. What shall we do? We killed the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, considering the prophecy of Joel, what would we expect Peter to tell them? Well, just call on the name of the Lord. Just do that. And that's exactly what he told them. Not in those exact words. But he did tell them something that certainly constitutes calling on the name of the Lord. 
I want us to look at the contrast. So this is what Peter told them. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of, the Lord, of, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remember I said the Bible is its best interpreter? Look how well this aligns. So, Acts 2.21, Peter quoting Joel said, whoever. Later he said, every one of you. Shall call. Aligns with repent and be baptized. Uh Uh-oh. It's almost like if we're wondering what it means to call on the name of the Lord, we're being told right here. Uh, On the name aligns with in the name of the Lord aligns with of Jesus Christ and shall be saved aligns with for the remission of sins. It lines up perfectly. Peter tells them to call on the name of the Lord. He says, you need to submit yourself to Christ. You need to bow the knee to the one that you just put to death by repenting of your sins and being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means by the authority of Jesus Christ. And when we're baptized, we're baptized into his kingdom And being part of his kingdom, with any kingdom that has ever existed, is all about submission to the king. Take, for instance, Paul's statement recorded in Acts 25, verse 11. There, Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. The word appeal... I'm I'm going to try to say it, but it's probably not right. Some of you might know Greek better than me and can recite this better, but epiklumai, epiklumai, something like that. If you want the word written out, I'll write it for you sometime. Uh, Which is the same word that's translated call in the Greek, or calling. In Acts 2.21, in Romans 10.13, it's the same word that's used, calling on the name of the Lord. And by Paul saying, I appeal to Caesar, he's not just saying, I'm calling on Caesar to save me. Paul is appealing to Caesar, and he's submitting himself to whatever Caesar requires of him in order to have an audience with Caesar. You see, if, if you're going to walk in the presence of Caesar, you don't just burst open through the doors and walk in and say, hey, I need to talk to Caesar that probably wouldn't go very well. He was asking for his case to be transferred to Caesar's court and that Caesar hear and pass judgment on his case. And in doing so, he is resting his case with Caesar's judgment. But in order, to that, in order for that to be done, Paul has to submit to whatever was necessary to appear before Caesar. He would have to submit to the Roman soldiers who took him to the context of Caesar. He would submit to whatever procedures or whatever behaviors were necessary to enter Caesar's court. All of this was involved in his appeal to Caesar. He had to submit himself to Caesar. And so Paul's calling or appeal to Caesar involved submission. That's what it was about. Submission. So in a nutshell, I believe calling on the name of the Lord is about submission to King Jesus. Or, in the Old Testament, prior to Jesus, submission to God. Now, a lot of people have taken this phrase, calling on the name of the Lord, to mean something very specific. Okay? Okay? Some people will say, it mean, calling on the name of the Lord means you say a prayer. Some people come this way and they say, calling on the name of the Lord means you're baptized. These are two things that are said, and these two things are very specific things that people are engaging in. We're going to get 
to more of that in a second, and I'm going to explain all that more. But I want to look at more verses first. Whenever Saul was seeking to arrest those who called on the name of Jehovah, or called on the name of the Lord, he was not seeking those who prayed to God. Even the Jews prayed to God. So, we can't say in the context of Saul seeking out those who called on the name of the Lord, that is talking about prayer. That's not what he's looking for. He's not looking for people who pray, pray to God. But instead, what Saul was looking for were people who had bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. People who had submitted themselves to Jesus Christ. That's the point. Those are the people that he was looking for. Those who obeyed Jesus and submitted to his authority. Interestingly, it's interesting, I can't say that, interestingly, Zephaniah 3 verse 9 links uh, calling on the name of the Lord with service. He says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, and they may, that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Service is what's being talked about here. So you can't just say a prayer and then live your life with assurance without submitting. It doesn't work that way. Sadly, that's what many think. As long as I say this prayer that Joel Osteen put on this video, as long as I just recite the things that he say, I can say I'm saved and not have to change my life one single bit. I've done what is necessary. I've met the criteria. As long as I believe in Christ and say a prayer, I'm good, and I'm accountable to nothing else in my life. This, a lot of this comes from a misunderstanding of these verses right here. Romans 10, 9-13. If you confess with your mouth that, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I want to get that straight right off the bat. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And then he quotes, quotes Joel 2.32, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what's been done is people have taken Romans 10.13, calling on the name of the Lord, and linked it with Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord. And they say, okay, so that is saying that Romans 10.13, or yeah, Romans 10.13 is Romans 10.9. This is where this whole theology comes from. And again, I believe Romans 10 verse 9 is a true statement because I believe what the Bible says. And I'm not going to you know, take it out of the Bible. We do have to confess that Jesus is Lord. That is absolutely necessary. But I don't think that Romans 10 verse 9 is the reason why Romans 10, 13 is here. I don't believe that's the case. What's being talked about here is there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Now, remember, I told you to put something in your back pocket, so pull out your all flesh card, okay? All flesh. Remember that from Joel 2.32, that the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. So the reason that verse 13 is here, the whole reason why it's quoted, is not to highlight verse 9, confessing with your mouth, but instead, it's highlighting that the gospel 
and obeying the gospel is open to all. It's been poured out on all flesh, as Joel 2 says, and there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. Anyone can obey the gospel and become a Christian, no matter who they are. Anyone has that opportunity. And again, that being said, we could say that confessing Christ is an outward manifestation of calling on the name of the Lord. I believe that is a possibility, that whenever we call the name of the Lord and we, we say Jesus is Lord, that is part of our submission to the Lord. But I do not believe that calling on the name of the Lord is a singular action. It's a full submission in every part of our life. Whenever we have a decision to make in my life, and we, those who are members here know I, I've painted this picture before, when we have a decision to make in life and we can go left and follow our own desires, or we can go right and follow Christ's desires and submit to Him, in doing so, we are calling on the name of the Lord. We are submitting ourselves to God or to Christ rather than our own desires. We can't say it's a singular action. Instead, it involves submission in every part of our life. Also, that being said, in the New Testament, when these things are quoted, most often it is linked to baptism. Because that is the point where we obey the gospel. When we take that step and we submit ourselves to the Lord. But again, I don't think that is a, that's a singular action. And I wouldn't say that that specifically is calling on the name of the Lord. But I would say that that is part of it, just like confessing Christ is part of it. Some people may disagree with me, and that's fine. I'm used to people disagreeing with me. In Acts 22 is one, one of these occasions. As the Apostle Paul addressed a mob in Jerusalem, he spoke of his encounter with, with Jesus Christ. So if you remember, Saul, or later Paul, was on the road to Damascus and he wanted to bring those who called on the name of the Lord to justice, or what justice was in his mind. He wanted to bring them forward on trial and maybe even have them put to death as Stephen was. And Jesus appeared to him and told him to go into Damascus. He blinded him and talked to him and said, go into Damascus and there wait what you must do. So he goes into Damascus. Paul, or Saul, demonstrates his belief by following those instructions and those commands, and he enters Damascus, and he waits for further instructions for three days. In those three days, what do you do after Jesus just appeared to you and blinded you and said, go to that town and wait further instructions? In Acts 9, we learn that during these three days, he spent time fasting and praying. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He spent all his time praying to God for three days. Many today would say at this point, Paul or Saul was saved because he spent this time in fasting on prayer and in doing that, he was calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Joel said. Ananias, who was a chosen messenger to Paul, did not think so. He did not tell Paul, you know, I, I've seen that you've already been calling on the name of the Lord. I've seen you've been doing that. You've been fasting and praying for three days. That's good. You've been saved. That's not what he said. After fasting and praying for three days, Saul was still lost in his sin. Even though he obviously believed at this point, even though he had prayed to God, 
he had yet to call on the name of the Lord for salvation. When Ananias finally came to Paul, he told him this, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He had seen a light from heaven. He had spoken with Jesus. He had been chosen by Jesus. He believed in Jesus. He repented. He fasted for three days. He prayed for three days. At this point, we'd probably be proclaiming that someone is a prophet if all these things had happened to them. And he had hands laid on him too. We would say, this man is a prophet. There's no way he's not saved. It's not what Ananias said. You still have your sins to deal with. Your sins have not been taken away. Our sins separate us from God. And we cannot obtain salvation with our sins in tow. It's not going to work. So Ananias told him, I know you haven't called on the name of the Lord yet, so let's take care of that. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. Just as Peter knew that those that he preached to on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 hadn't done that either. They had heard the word spoken. They believed it. They were cut to the heart. They were asking, what do we need to do? Paul said, repent and be baptized. So, that's what Ananias told him to do. Be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, describing what Paul needed to do in order to be saved, for the remission of sins, to have your sins washed away. So, every non-Christian, we might call it, who desires to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, does not simply do so by saying a prayer. That's not how it works. It's a submission to the Lord. And when you look at Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus saw this coming. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Many people will say that today. As long as you say, Lord, save me, and confess he is Lord, that's all you have to do. But Jesus says, Not everyone who says that will be saved, but he who does does. That that implies obedience on our part. That implies a submission on our part. That implies us bowing the knee to Jesus and proclaiming that he is my king and I will follow him and do whatever he asks me to do. He who does the will of my Father in heaven, those are the people who are going to be saved. We come obeying God's instructions and submitting to his rule, especially when it comes to obeying the gospel. The sinner's prayer is not one of those commands. If you look through your Bible, I've read the Bible, you will not find the sinner's prayer present in the Bible. It's not there. So we cannot expect a man-made tradition to grant us salvation with the Almighty when he's given us clear instructions to the contrary. To use the illustration from earlier, he said, meet me at the park. Call on my name. Don't go to the grocery store. That's not where you're going to find him. You're going to find him here by doing the will of the Father. Father.